We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best-in-class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one-on-one long-term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. My favorite thing about working in healthcare is the people. This industry brings together brilliant, highly motivated individuals who are driven by the opportunity to make a difference. My name is Hallie Tecco, and this is The Heart of Healthcare, a podcast where I'll be introducing you to the people on the ground moving the needle in public health and medicine. Buddy, and I want to ask you something. What is the number one way to practice safe sex? A condom? No. Birth control? Uh-uh. A double condom. No, silly. It's abstinence. Abstinence? What's that? It means not to do something. Because the best way to practice safe sex is not to do it at all. For decades, our country has failed to teach young people comprehensive sexual health education. The abstinence-only education I received in high school and which continues today with federal funding has been described as scientifically and ethically problematic. This curriculum shames young people and fails to meet their health needs. Topics like birth control options and how to use a condom are completely missing, while instead focusing on the idea that abstinence from sex is the only morally acceptable option. And the worst part about it? Abstinence-only sex ed, also known as sexual risk avoidance, has been shown to actually increase teen pregnancies. Today on The Heart of Healthcare, I'm talking to Nora Gelperin. Nora is the Director of Sexuality Education and Training at Advocates for Youth. She is one of the co-authors of Advocates' Rights, Respect, Responsibility, a K-12 sexuality education curriculum, which is used worldwide. She is a proponent for evidence-based comprehensive sex ed, which is supported by leading professional organizations ranging from the AMA to ACOG and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Nora, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. We know abstinence-only sex ed doesn't work and needs to go. Can you tell us more about why it's been a failed experiment for our children? Yeah, so similar to any of the Just Say No campaigns, denying young people uh, potentially life-saving information has never been helpful. And actually, what we know about abstinence-only programs is not only do they fail young people uh, by censoring and withholding information about how your body works, how to get uh, health care, um, what's normal when it comes to healthy relationships, we also know that they deny young people information that can at times um, lead them to have an increased risk for sexually transmitted infections. So not only are they ineffective, but they're downright harmful. Wow. So... When I was in, I guess, middle school, I had to sign an abstinence until marriage pledge. Does that still exist? Uh, We know. It It does, but I don't think it's as uh, prominent as it was before. Uh, What's encouraging is that there has been study after study on abstinence-only programs and specifically uh, pledges of abstinence. And we just know that they just don't work. They're not effective and they can be harmful. And we also know that abstinence-only programs often render invisible LGBTQ young people or students who have LGBTQ families members. So we know that that's a really important population that we need to have um, included in all of our programs. Yeah, that absolutely. That, those topics were not covered um, when I was in school. Oh. So proponents of abstinence only sex ed, they would say that, hey, teen pregnancy is down. This must be working. How would you respond to that? 
Sure. So it is really exciting to see the decreases in unintended teen pregnancy. And really, the vast majority of that decrease is due to more contraception. So we have more contraception available, and we also have newer methods of contraception that are way more effective. So those things are really wonderful. And it's thanks to young people accessing those methods that we can really look to that decrease. At the same time, we know that there's also increases in sexually transmitted infections. Because these new methods of contraception, like the patch, the implant, the shot, are really only designed to prevent pregnancy, young people need and deserve information about how to protect themselves from sexually transmitted infections, what the symptoms are, where to go to get tested, what the prevention techniques are. So we need to keep up our efforts around sex education to make sure they have all the information that they need. Interesting. So in terms of contraception access, are teens able to access birth control without their parents' knowledge? Yes. So if they have a clinic available to them uh, that's got federal funding we call Title X Clinic, that ensures that it's available for young people without parental consent Mm -hmm. um, or parental notification, which is a big concern, as you can imagine, of many young people. Sometimes what gets tricky, though, is depending on where you live, there may not be a lot of clinics available. Um, Like we see this week in Texas around uh, abortion access, the same is happening for contraceptive access. We know some of those clinics, either due to the pandemic or due to changes in funding, are really decreasing. They're really having to close their doors. So access tends to be the biggest issue. But if you are lucky enough to have a clinic in your area, you do have a right to access that without parental notification. Can we talk about sex education as a human right for teens and how you balance that with what may be, say, a religious parent's right to dictate what their child is taught in school? Absolutely. So all good quality sex education programs really seek to partner with parents and caregivers. We all want young people to be receiving information about knowledge and skills that help them make healthy decisions both now and into the future. We also know that if a parent does have a sincerely held moral or religious objection to some of the programs or some of the lesson plans, they always have the right to opt their child out and provide that information um, in the home according to their values. So Um, It's never a requirement for, you know, all students to attend, regardless of how their families feel. The parents always have that right. And at the same time, we want to make sure that young people get the information that they need. Does that violate that teen's human right for sex education if the parent is teaching misinformation at home? Yeah. So I think what we really see happen time and again is that young people are hungry for this information. They need it to make informed, healthy decisions in their life. And if they're not getting it at school, they're not getting it at home, they're going to go to really unreliable sources like the internet and Google (laughs) um, or their friends. And so we know those sources don't really have accurate information either. So what's really encouraging is that, you know, over the last 30 years, poll after poll of parents has shown that the vast majority really do want their kids to receive comprehensive sex education. They want their young people to get that information. Um, And we know that if it's not being provided at school or at home, they're going to other places that are just not reliable, just not good quality sex education. Yeah. Are you seeing that most students that you work with are coming with a baseline understanding of human reproduction and they had the birds and the bees conversations at home? Or do you sense that parents are neglecting to have those conversations and leaving it totally up to the schools to deliver that content. Yeah, you know, it's really ironic. I find when I do workshops for parents and caregivers, they always say, I want to talk to my kid. I'm just waiting for them to bring it up. And then I would do a workshop for young people and they say, I'm just waiting for my parent to bring it up. If they thought it was important, Mm -hmm. they would talk about it and no one gets the conversation started. (laughs) So I think what's really important is to utilize those teachable moments, something you see in the media, something that's in a movie or celebrity culture and talk about what your values are, talk about what your beliefs are, what do you want for your kids when it comes to their romantic lives, their sexual lives, their feelings about body image and social media? There's so many great uh, opportunities to start those conversations, whether it's at home or with its trusted adults, um, that we really need to utilize those because far too many young people are walking into classrooms with absolutely no information. They may have gotten one class period on puberty if they were lucky, or maybe something in eighth grade that was just say no until you're older, uh, but they don't have 
have the breadth of information and the skills they need to be able to make those healthy decisions for themselves. Yeah. I mean, it's all so rooted in our society and shame and the conversations can feel so awkward. The giggles in the class when it's delivered by, uh, you know, a teacher, a health teacher, or when your parents try to have that conversation. I just remember like shivering, like, oh, mom, stop talking about it. <laughs> I, I mean, this is, is, is this a culture thing in the US? Do you see other cultures that have been able to successfully have com- these conversations in between generations? Yeah. So uh, we at Advocates for Youth used to lead a European study tour where we would take professionals in sex education from the United States over to uh, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Those three countries in particular come to mind because they all give the same messages to their young people about the importance of waiting until you're ready, about the importance of finding someone that you can trust and someone that you care about and that cares about you. And these messages are given by families, by faith, by schools, by healthcare providers. And we really see when all of the cultural messages kind of point in a similar direction, young people delay sex, they start having sex later in life, they have fewer partners, they feel more intimacy and more uh, high quality of those relationships, and they have less unintended pregnancy and sexually transmitted infection. So yes, we have a lot to learn here in the United States from some of our Western European colleagues about how to do this well. Oh my goodness. And how does porn come into play. Yeah, so it's a great example for all young people of natural and normal curiosity. And if you're not getting the information from trusted sources, you're going to go to the internet. And it's really easy to find a whole range of pornographic images and videos, um, amateur, professional, uh, sexually explicit media is everywhere. So I tell parents, it's not a matter of if your kid will see porn, it's a matter of when. And so we really want to make sure that our lessons in schools and our conversations at home are really helping young people better navigate and decipher and decode the messages that are coming through in pornography, because that's not realistic, not real bodies, not real life. We want to make sure that young people don't have their expectations changed around what a healthy, consensual, intimate, uh, loving relationship looks like uh, versus what they may see in pornography. So we need to help them navigate that and break that down. Is anybody working on creating healthy porn for teens and young adults. I mean, it feels so, it feels like you couldn't do it, but it feels like it could be needed. Like if they are going to access, um, you know, sexually explicit content, is there a way to offer something that is a a healthy, safe version. Yeah. So it's really interesting. There's a researcher, Dr. Emily Rothman uh, from Boston University and her colleagues at the health department in Boston there have created what they called um, a literacy curriculum around sexually explicit media. So if we're not going to, you know, be able to impact the pornography industry writ large, we are going to help young people really analyze those messages that they're seeing in pornography, understand the importance of consent and equity in relationships, understand that bodies don't look that way. That's all special (laughs) effects, right? That bodies don't behave that way. That is so special effects. Um, And so this pornography literacy curriculum really helps young people kind of um, analyze those influences and look at those medias um, with a much more careful eye. Do all students have access to that curriculum? So it's a curriculum that's offered after school. I'm not aware of a school yet (laughs) being able to pick it up there. You do see some states like California in particular that have started to put um, analysis of sexually explicit media into their state standards. We put it into the national sex ed standards as well, just trying to recognize that it is so pervasive and then young people need help really deciphering the messages that they're getting there. Yeah, absolutely. That's so interesting. Um, So we hear a lot about children having sex younger and younger. I'm curious if there's any truth to that or if that's a myth. Yeah, so we really haven't seen the age of first intercourse decrease significantly. Um, We've actually seen it increase, which is exciting. I think if you were to further break down that data, it really depends on geography, it depends on gender, it depends on a whole range of things. Um, But overall, in terms of the national average, we have not seen that go down. If anything, we've seen it inch up a little bit, which is really encouraging. And what age is it at now? Yeah, so it's uh, 16 for young men and just over 17 for young women. Oh, interesting. So young men are... A little bit earlier. With, younger, with, with older women or older girls? <laughs> yeah, it could be or same age. Yeah, a whole, a whole range, right? Yeah, yeah. 
So you really focus on what's called comprehensive sex education. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. So tell us some highlights of it, like what topics you cover, how it focuses on reducing shame. Sure. So the goal of comprehensive sex ed is really to help young people navigate sexual development and grow into sexually healthy adults. And we know under that umbrella, there's a whole, uh, you know, range of important topics for them to learn about starting in kindergarten and going all the way through 12th grade. And those would include anything related to a anatomy, healthy friendships, puberty, of course, um, consent. uh, What is it like to be a good friend? What is it like to have romantic feelings for the first time? Interpersonal violence um, and how to seek help and prevention related to those. So it's a whole range of topics. um, And really, you want to deliver them in age and developmentally appropriate ways, just like we teach math, just like we teach language arts. You start with the fundamentals around, uh, you know, healthy boundaries, what is a variety variety of uh, families look like and, you know, all different kinds of ways that families come together. And then you build on those um, so that as they age, you can add more cognitively complex material, just like we would start with here are the numbers and then here's addition and then multiplication and algebras down the road. Same thing for sex education. You mentioned interpersonal violence as one of the topics. Can you tell me more about that? What's covered there? Yeah, so interpersonal violence would cover things related to um, rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment, incest, domestic violence. Obviously, when you're talking about the younger grades, we're going to be talking about child sexual abuse and prevention techniques related to that. One of the things that often is a surprise to people is if we actually teach young children the correct names for their genitals, for their body parts, so they know what those parts are called, it's not just private parts or down there, they're actually actually less likely to be preyed upon by sexual predators uh, because those predators know to choose kids that are ignorant of those names and that because they're less likely to report. So we know even starting with little kids and just saying things like this is your vulva, this is your scrotum, this is your penis is super helpful and important. I know it may not be easy. It certainly takes some practice, but it can really help protect young kids. Note to any parents listening. (laughs) Exactly. I always like to say start before they can even speak. And by the time your kids are talking, you'll get comfortable too. Normalize it. (laughs) Absolutely. We'll be right back after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. So tell us about your organization, Advocates for Youth. Sure. So Advocates really works alongside young people in the United States and actually around the world to fight for sexual health rights and justice. That means in addition to our sex ed work, we work with youth leaders who are fighting for reproductive justice, justice for sexual assault survivors, contraceptive access, as we've talked about, ending HIV stigma, and LGBTQ health and rights, among many others. So we work in partnership with hundreds of young people each year to ensure that sexual health and rights at every level, from the federal and state policy to school districts and campuses. Amazing. And you guys started something I saw called Free the Pill, the hashtag Free the Pill movement (laughs) to make birth control available over the counter, which is such a great idea. Tell me more about this. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to acknowledge that we actually didn't start the Free the Pill, but what we did was we brought young people to the table. Um, So we have a youth council, which is a collaboration between us at Advocates for Youth and IBIS Reproductive Health. And this youth council is made up of youth activists from across the country who are all working in their own communities to bring birth control over the counter, covered by insurance and with no age restrictions. 
restriction. Because we know birth control pills, you know, prevent countless unintended pregnancies, but only if you have the means, the insurance, and the time to get a prescription from your doctor first. So for young people, especially low income and marginalized youth, the obstacles to gaining and filling a prescription for birth control can really feel insurmountable. Um, And we know that young people shouldn't have to jump through those unnecessary hoops to gain the contraceptive care that they need. So just like with condoms and emergency contraception, we really believe the pill should be available over the counter as it is in a hundred countries around the world, right? So that's what the Free the Pill Youth Council is fighting for. And it's it's for the pill or also for implant and so this depot shot, et cetera. Yeah. So we're starting with a pill and then okay. I wouldn't be surprised if efforts continue from there. People who oppose this, what do they say? Why why not have it available over the counter? Are there any downsides? Yeah. So I think there are concerns around taking control away from parents. There are concerns around, um, you know, medical indications. Maybe a young person has some medical condition could be some of the concerns. But we know that birth control pills are incredibly safe. They've been available for decades upon decades. And like a hundred other countries who've been able to do this successfully, it's something we can replicate here in the United States. Sure. Well, I've I also feel like there's at least when I was a teen, a level of shame. Like if I if I was on the pill, it must be because I'm promiscuous. Yeah, I think that there are still some of those misconceptions. But yeah. what we know is that the birth control pill is actually used for lots of reasons in addition to pregnancy prevention, um, around uh, decreasing the intensity of someone's periods if they're really heavy or have really intense cramps. It could also regulate someone's menstrual cycle a little better, particularly during the adolescent years. Sometimes it can help with acne. So it has a lot of other benefits in addition to uh, preventing pregnancy. And many times young people are on the pill just for those benefits by themselves. Sure. Yep. Yeah, I think that's an important message that should get across. And maybe, maybe changing the name from birth control to something right. else would be helpful. Just like <laughs> it's estrogen. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Good idea. So we all face naysayers in healthcare. I'm hoping you can tell me a little bit about some of the biggest roadblocks that you faced in your work. Yeah, so I would say, particularly uh, in the last couple of weeks, the biggest roadblock we're facing is folks who want to move the country backwards. So whether it's Mm -hmm. people who are still proponents of abstinence only until marriage programs, or anti-abortion movement, or people who want to deny the rights or even the existence of transgender young people, there's a really small but a very vocal minority that's intent on really denying reality and imposing their own values on everybody else. Um, And we're seeing them just have a willingness to mislead lead and lie and a willingness to attack young people um, as individuals, which is just really unacceptable. Um, And they're getting bolder and they're putting young people and everyone who's working for justice at risk. So we saw a teacher of sex education in New York City last year come under extreme personal attacks just because she was teaching medically accurate, age appropriate sex education. It was just unbelievable. We've heard transphobic protesters at school board meetings um, at times getting violent about transgender young people uh, being able to be seen and affirmed in schools and and have a safe place to uh, go to school. So at Advocates, we really always work to engage young people to push for more progressive policies at the local, state, and federal level and make more resources available to both young people and the educators and youth serving professionals. Sure. So you mentioned trans youth a few times there, and I'm curious to hear the status of gender affirming treatment and care for young people, um, especially young people who aren't in large cities where access to these specialists is, is highly available. Yeah, and we saw some really concerning legislation that was introduced that thankfully was uh, beaten back by the courts uh, in the process. But it's really life saving, literally, for transgender young people to not only have affirming health care and access to hormone blockers and different uh, medical advances, but also in their homes and in their schools to be called their preferred name, to be use the correct pronouns that align with their gender identity. And when we're not able to support them in these ways, it can have categories catastrophic consequences. Uh, We know upwards of 50% of transgender and non-binary young people have not only thought about suicide, but one in five of them um, have actually attempted suicide. So it really is life and death here. Um, And we, all of us as adults, need to do more uh, for trans young people to make sure that they're safe, they're affirmed, they're healthy, they're happy, and they have their rights protected. Yeah, absolutely. We're all familiar with the recent Texas abortion ban. What does this mean for young adults? 
Absolutely. So this will have a devastating impact on young people in Texas being able to exercise their constitutional right to decide to have an abortion if they decide that what's best for themselves and their future is to not continue the pregnancy. Unfortunately, what this new law does is uh, require that procedure to happen before most people people, adults and teenagers, would even know that they are pregnant. So it's really going to have a devastating impact on young people. Uh, Young people are less likely to have the means of transportation to go out of state. They're less likely to have the financial resources to fund such a trip. Um, And that tends to delay when they would get a procedure, which we know um, is a little bit riskier for them the longer into the pregnancy it goes. So we're going to see unintended pregnancy increase in Texas, no thanks to the governor and the legislators who made this bill. And I think what's so devastating is that this makes it really challenging for courts to um, prevent this bill from going into effect, as we saw from the Supreme Court ruling. So I think until the Supreme Court takes up this case in October, um, it's really going to have a devastating impact on teens in Texas. Wow. And there's no exception for rape or incest. Absolutely not. It's heartbreaking. And um, I'm curious how you guys see your work in areas that might be more culturally challenging to work in. Yeah. So I think that work is definitely harder uh, (laughs) when you're in a more politically conservative environment in the Southeast and the Midwest, for sure. We really find that our youth activists are incredibly effective person to person. You know me, you know my family, you know where I come from. I'm like you. Making those personal connections, starting with some of the policy changes, maybe at a school building level or a school district level. We have a lot of youth activists working on their college campuses to really even doing things like having um, gender neutral bathrooms available, allowing students to have their preferred names on their um, documents for colleges and universities or their graduation diploma. So some of those things may seem um, trivial, may seem small, but um, as you start to build them over time, you really do see culture shift happening. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next for you and Advocates for Youth? What are you guys working on? Yeah, so right now we're really looking forward to our Youth Activist Institute, where we bring together virtually this year again, about 150 (laughs) young people from across the country. And we're really bringing them together for training and collaboration on sexual health rights and justice. And each young person leaves uh, having really created their own strategic plan about the change they want to make in their community. And while with us, they learn about policymaking, advocacy, and we even do a virtual lobby day where they get to meet with their representatives and senators, and then take all those skills back home where we continue to support them to help them achieve their goals. It's really, really wonderful to be part of. That's awesome. How can we support your work? Yeah, so I appreciate that question. And folks can support us and get involved by following us at Advocates Tweets on Twitter at Advocates for Youth on Instagram or advocatesforyouth.org slash donate. We certainly appreciate all the support that we can get. Well, it's been great to talk to you today. Thank you for the important work that you do. And um, on behalf of former teens everywhere who were forced (laughs) to sign abstinent pledges, this work is so critical. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Thank you so much for listening. This is our 10th and last episode of season one of The Heart of Healthcare. And we'd love to know what you think please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or send us an email at contact at offscript.com. That's contact at O-F-F-S-C-R-I-P.com. Tell us what you liked, what you want more of, and what we can do better. Before season two launches in early 2022, we'll be sharing a few bonus interviews, including speakers at the Rock Health Summit. If you haven't yet, subscribe to be the first to know. Another myth might be that some of the uh, contraceptions that that are out there, condoms, are 100% foolproof, and they are not. The only thing that's 100% foolproof regarding pregnancy and STDs is abstinence. You guys all know what abstinence is, right? Abstinence is not having sex.